Hello, everyone, and welcome again to Nicomachean Ethics. And we're still in Book 1, Chapter 6, Part C. We're still doing the little background. The previous one, if you haven't checked it out, was on Plato and his theories of the forms, the EDOS. Remember, if, you, if, you, if you've forgotten already, remember the EDOS is something that is not psychological. And it's sometimes translated as idea, which has psychological connotations. A little better is form. So if you've forgotten all that, go back and look at the previous video on, on uh, Plato. But here we're doing Aristotle because we're working our way up to Aristotle's criticisms of Plato. And you need a little background on Plato. And now you need a little bit of a background on Aristotle and the categories. How he sees things and how he thinks the universe is kind of constructed in, in a way. Now, again, like the theories of forms, Aristotle's notion of the categories are an, are an object of much scholarly debate. So I'm giving you just a rough idea uh, that we can take away to help us understand his criticisms of uh, Plato's idea of the good later on in uh, Book 1, Chapter 6. So the categories, there's a variety of ways that we can talk about them, but they're really the ways in which things, and I put in scare quotes, can be. How things can be in the world. All different kinds of things. Or another way to think about is categories are the way that we talk about things and how we say that they are. So we're looking at kinds of things, the general sorts of big sort of categories or kinds that the things in the universe will fit into and how we talk about them. Now, a big thing that we want to be aware of here with the notion of the categories is this little word is. And Aristotle is well aware and says that a number of philosophers have not really understood this term all that well. What does the word is mean? Of course, we use that term all the time. We talk about uh, things are, this is, that is, those are, etc., etc. We use the term uh, is in a variety of ways. Let's look at a couple of ways that, uh, and if you confuse them, you can end up with some nonsense. So here's a couple of examples. It's some, some simple sentences. James Bond is tall. Now, you have is. James Bond is 007. And you have another is. But, same word, but different meanings. In this one, James Bond is tall, that is the is of predication, ascribing a property to James Bond. Right? The second one, James Bond is 007, that's the is of identity. So, if you think, okay, well, what's really the difference? Well, with identity, if you take James, any sentence with James Bond in it, you can plug in 007. So, if you say, James Bond is licensed to kill, okay, uh, you could take out double, you could take the James Bond out and put 007 and say, 007 is licensed to kill. Go to this one. So, with the is of identity, you can these are interchangeable. But with the is of predication, these are not interchangeable. James Bond is licensed to kill. You can't say tall is licensed to kill. That doesn't really make any sense because you're using the is of predication as if it were the is of identity. So another, another way to think of it is the, the term James Bond and tall are linked through predication. And if a term like a name like James Bond is linked to another term like a predicate through this is of predication, you can't act as if they were linked with the is of identity. James Bond and 007 are linked with the is of identity. That allows you to replace James Bond with 007. And because James Bond and Tall are linked with predication, you cannot replace James Bond with Tall in every situation. So, the takeaway point here is that is has different uses. And if you get those wrong, if you confuse them, you can end up insisting on certain things as making sense which are truly nonsensical. So that's sort of the big point in, uh, in the whole thing of Aristotle on the categories is getting this notion of is uh, uh, is getting it correct, understanding that it has different uses, different meanings. And if you think 
I'm not going to go into this in, gen in, in, in any depth here, but if you think that the word is always has the same meaning, then you can get all kinds, you can, you, can, uh, you can develop all kinds of very intractable philosophical problems. And Aristotle uh, more or less says that Parmenides, the great pre-Socratic thinker, makes fundamental linguistic confusions regarding the term is. In the, in the, certainly in the 20th century, Wittgenstein, the great uh, uh, Austrian uh, thinker, was deeply concerned with the fact that we didn't understand language properly and that philosophical problems were ultimately linguistic problems. There weren't any real philosophical problems, according to Wittgenstein. They were problems of language. Once you get your language sorted out, you understand all these things, philosophical problems, they're not solved, they're dissolved. So Aristotle, in one sense, is kind of an early, early, early version of Wittgenstein in the sense that he's saying, look, some philosophical problems really could be gotten rid of or at least diminished or perhaps dissolved by a better understanding of language. So first big takeaway, categories, different ways things can be, different uses and meanings of this little tiny word is. And the equivalent in Greek is a, a very complex uh, verb and, you know, you'd have to go and study ancient Greek grammar to get all the nuances of that. But that's the thrust of Aristotle's uh, story in, 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 these, uh, in this little background that I want to present. Well, I've got a couple of other examples, three little examples, just to illustrate some terminology that can come in handy because it comes up once in a while in the Nicomachean Ethics and it's good to uh, be at least familiar with it. If I point to a, a, a man and an ox, and I say, man, and I say, is an animal, and I say, ox is an animal. So here, the is from man and ox is used in the same way, right? Man is an animal, ox, an ox is an animal. So it's used in the same way. They're synonymous. They're synonym. It's used in the sense of synonymy. All right. So you have different, different things, and you have the same word is, same meaning. So different things, same word, same meaning. All right. So that's your first notion of the word is. So man and ox, the is is used in the same way. Well, the categories are the ways in which things can be. So the way is functions with man, ox, and animal use in the same way. So man and ox are going to be in the same category. Think of another one here. Baseball bat and bat. The word, same word bat shows up in both. Right? I'm, and I put the word baseball in just to give you an indicator. But if I had like a baseball bat here and a real bat, right, I could point to both and say, you know, that's a bat. That is a bat. Well, in this sense, we've got uh, different things, the same word. So different things is, again, the same word. That is a bat and that is a bat. But we have different meanings, right, because a baseball bat and a, and, a, and a fruit bat, obviously the word bat is used in a different, in a different way. And in this, in this sense, we are using the word is homonymously. All right. So in this sense, we've got synonymy, homonymy, and in the third example, we've got grammar and grammarian. So we could say something like, Joe, uh, uh, Joe, is, uh, Joe has good grammar, and Joe is a grammarian. So has grammar, right? Or has good grammar, or can uh, display his good grammar, and Joe is a grammarian. Here we're not talking so much about the word is, but the relationships between words grammar and grammarian, they sound a lot alike. They have the same kind of feel to them, but they're different things and they're derived meanings. So what we've got here is a, a few examples of how we use 
these words in different ways. Sometimes it's the same word, sometimes they're related words. And in this case, in the third one here, we've got uh, the word grammar. Using things paronymously. So within uh, uh, the, the way we use our language, we've got all different ways in which we use words. And if you're not careful, and keeping all this separate, you're going to run into all kinds of confusions. So Aristotle is saying, in order to uh, uh, work all this out, you have to be aware of the way that is functions, and also, in general, how words can function in different ways. If you, Again, if you don't have that clear, you're going to get into uh, all kinds of troubles. So what Aristotle seems to be saying is that words like is and exists they're related to each other, but they're often used uh, paronymously, just like Joe has grammar and Joe is a grammarian. So is and exist, we think that they might mean the same thing, and they don't mean radically different things. They're related, but they, they're not identical. All right, so various things and various meanings. Now, moreover, the term is is sometimes used uh, synonymously, like James Bond, is uh, it, here, James Bond is tall, and if I say James Bond is tall, and the apple is red. Well, the is, in both cases, is functioning in terms of predication, right? Is tall, is red. That's the is of predication. So the term is sometimes is used as in uh, uh, synonymously, but again, it can be used homonymously, and it can be used, in again, with is and exist, paronymously. So the term is, once again, different uses and meanings, get that straight and you won't run into all these uh, uh, philosophical problems. As Aristotle said, philosophers hadn't really understood the language correctly and they ran into deep uh, confusions. So Aristotle brings in a number of pieces of analysis here uh, that he, pre not so much in this criticism, but he's presupposing a lot of this when he makes his criticisms of Plato, which can make the criticism of Plato very obscure if you don't know what the theories of forms are, what Plato may have thought, you know, and Yidos is, and if you don't really understand Aristotle's construction of categories, then all of the criticisms of Book 6 will be extremely difficult, if not nearly impossible, to follow. So Aristotle says uh, that things are organized in categories and they're res they, they are organized, again, the ways in which things can be, how we talk about things. So just as a point of illustration, I'm just going to shift to the various categories and there's quite a few of them. So the categories, that is the ways in which things can be, they can be substance, talk about quantity, quality, relation, where, and as in time, uh, uh, or, or sorry, as in, as in space, when is in time, uh, position, orientation, having in terms of possession, doing in case of activity, in terms of an active side, and then being affected in the case of a passive side. So all of these we could uh, illustrate and more or less borrow an example if we talk about a horse. Okay, so let's just do a, a simple breakdown of all the different ways that we can talk about a horse. Well, we can talk about a horse in terms of, um, uh, of a subject, right? The horse is, right? As a, sorry, not a subject, but a substance, right? The horse, in that sense, the horse uh, exists. Um, quantity, well, there's one horse. And the quality, you might talk about, uh, or, you know, what qualities it's had, what properties it has. We could say, let's say it's, it's brown or, or white or whatever, depending on what the, the horse is. Um, and relations, it might be, let's say it's a Clydesdale, so you'd say largest or larger than others, larger. Or it might be, you know, maybe like a little Shetland pony, so it's really small. Or so its relation to other uh, horses would be tiny. Uh, where, you know, in the where is it? Well, it's in the stable. And again, you can fill all these in by talking about all the different ways that we talk about horse, and all the different ways, all the different categories reflect the different ways that we talk about it. So in that sense, now you can see Aristotle is breaking up 
our language by trying to show all the different uses and all the different notions of uh, uh, predication. In other words, if the big takeaway from this is that this little word is, if we go back here, remember it has different uses, different meanings, and we've got different uh, examples to show us of the complexity of language. You've got the is of predication, is of identity, but even when we're predicating, it changes. So it's one thing to say that the horse is, in terms of substance, and there is, I'm using is across categories, right? There is one horse, well now it's the is of quantity, and the horse is brown, now that's the is of, uh, of quality. So this little term, the is, so the is, it predicates across categories. Okay, so this get, try and understand this notion of predication of cross categories, because in one sense we're here, we're in one category using is, we're in another category using is, another one. So the is is predicated uh, in relation to horse across different categories, and the is will change as it goes. But what's important here for an upcoming criticism is that although is may change according to the category, its meaning, you can predicate it across categories, and it will change its meaning, but, so the meaning changes across categories, but within a category, if you say the horse is, the dog is, the book is, that is predicating is within a category, right, of substance. The horse is, the dog is, the cat is, the whiteboard is. So the is is used within the category of substance where different things, same word, uh, same meaning, that's used synonymously. So the word is within a category will be synonymous. It's keeping and preserving its meaning. But... When things get more complicated, as over here, where you're using a term that might be about different things and it's moving its meaning around, it could be being used homonymously or peronymously. So, is seems to be fairly well behaved in terms of being a, a linguistic object. But, as we're going to see in a bit, this term, good, is not so well behaved. This one is, a, is even more complex. It relates somewhat to is in terms of some aspects of behavior, but the term good gets even more complicated. And that's what Aristotle wants to zero in, is the complexity of the term good. And if you don't recognize that complexity, you're going to say all kinds of ridiculous things, and you're going to get your ethics wrong. So in order, so remember, let's not lose sight of what this is all about. It's not just an exercise in linguistics. It's not just an exercise to be fancy, to use all these fancy kinds of terms. These are technical terms that are designed for a purpose of keeping our language clear, not, as Wittgenstein would say, to get bewitched by our language, but to keep it clear, to keep it straight, and to make our criticisms of Plato in, as Aristotle would say, clear and consistent. And he thinks Plato makes some fundamental errors. So now, with this background of Plato's ideas, or at least the version that I think Aristotle is criticizing, plus this equipment here in terms of understanding the complexity of the word is, and the warning that the word good is going to be an even more complex term, we are now ready in the ne for the next video in which I'll dig into Aristotle's actual criticisms, and there's a whole pile of them, of, of uh, Plato's use of the term good as a foundational term in ethics. So stay tuned for that.